afternoon, everyone. We are glad you are here today for Global Voices, featuring a four-person panel here. Um, I will go ahead and make some short introductions, and then um, we will begin with a word of prayer and begin with our discussion. All right. Um, at the far end, we have Dr. Mandy Howard, who is an assistant professor of psychology here at Sanford's Ho Howard College of Arts and Science. Her work integrates theory, research, and practice in a concentrated effort to increase understanding of the in interpersonal processes underlying mental health and quality of life for youth in the child welfare system and to improve professional training and practices. Next to her is Garth Thorpe, originally from Annapolis, Maryland, who graduated from Portland, Oregon with a degree in theology and educational ministries. He's also earned his master's in instructional design and performance improvement. And after college, he served for two and a half years in Bangladesh working with the Rohingya Muslim refugees, also translating an unwritten language into, an oral, into oral Bible stories. Now Garth is part of Lifeline's unadopted team where he manages various orphan care projects around the world. Next to him is Johnny Grimes, who is the owner of Wheelhouse Salon and the director of international partnerships of No More Orphans. Johnny holds both bachelor's and master's degree from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and has over a decade experience in church planting, orphan care, and nonprofit leadership management. He's been married for 15 years to Courtney and they have three children, River, Penelope, and Sailor. Next is Matt Wilson, who's also an adopted father and foster father who has a passion to connect local churches and a heart to care for vulnerable children around the world. He currently works with Compassion International, helping U.S. churches live out their faith by engaging global missions through child sponsorship. He's also um, a graduate of the University of Mobile, New Orleans Seminary, and he and his wife are parents to three girls. All right, well, I'm going to begin us with a quick prayer, and then we will get started with our questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your call to care for the, the fatherless and the, those who are without a voice. And so today, Lord, we thank you for bringing each of our speakers here to help us to know how to better care for the people that you've called us to love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, just to begin our conversation, I would just like to ask the question, just so that we have a general working definition, what is an orphan, and are all kids in orphanages true orphans? We'll start with Dr. Howard. Uh, so when, I, when I'm working with children, I, I work with kids that have a history of trauma. Um, I prefer the term vulnerable children because many times children that are in orphanage care aren't necessarily parentless or fatherless. Uh, many times, especially in, in certain regions of the world, it's not an uncommon practice. Uh, if a family is struggling financially or if someone has to go away to work, uh, they'll, they'll drop a child off at an institutional care uh, place with full intentions of coming back and getting them when financially or physically they, they can handle that. Um, that being said, those kids still need intervention and those kids still need uh, all of the things that we talk about when we talk about working with children with a history of trauma. Um, so w when you look at the literature, even though orphan is the term we most often think about, um, folks in the community and folks in the science more often talk about vulnerable children, so you can include even those that have both parents, also children that are living on the streets, uh, children that are in human trafficking types of situations, and, and kind of globally across that board. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the doctor in the room giving a great answer. Uh, I, I would maybe just add one thing to that is uh, where we work internationally, we've kind of even been, uh, kind of expanded our scope to include vulnerable children. We work with orphan and vulnerable children, but. Uh, Another key piece, too, that internationally things just get messy as well. Uh, you don't necessarily have necessarily a true orphan. Uh, you have social orphans. You have poverty creating a lot of different things in a lot of different communities. And so I think when we talk about, you know, what is an orphan and what does an orphan look like, demographics and internationally things can, 
they change, right? We have these nice, neat definitions here, but in the, in the systems that, that we serve in internationally, things change dramatically. Uh, another, another key piece, I'll give an example of, of how that takes place. In Liberia, uh, before the war, there were 13 orphanages present in the country. After the Civil War that, that transpired, there were 120. Were all those kids orphans? No. But what had happened was the war and the situations had caused a wide upspring of these orphanages. And now that they're in a home, they're considered orphans. And so it, it, it answers the question, but it also maybe muddies the water a little bit to, sh to say that this, there's orphans and then you have social orphans and you have vulnerable children kind of all in one mixture internationally. So. You know, I think another term, and, and you pray for them, is, is just praying for the fatherless as well. Um, I think in a lot of the countries that we look at, um, many of the people that we consider vulnerable children are, are because they are fatherless. Um, I think about the story of uh, a friend of mine, Richmond Wandera. He was, he was born in Uganda, uh, and to a, a mom and a dad, they, they worked, they cared for him. But when the dad passed away, his dad passed away, his life changed very quickly because the, the, the wife, the mother, um, wasn't able to really own that property or make that money. So all of a sudden, he went from being cared for by a family because now he's now fatherless, uh, became thrown into a very vulnerable situation his entire family did. And so we see that across the world. And that's just the state of, of how some of our our countries and areas just, just view women and their, their role in their society as well. Great. Our next question is, what are the specific effects of orphanage rearing, and how can we adjust our caregiving to meet the needs of the children with this history? Any of you guys want to? Let's throw that back to the doctor. Well, I would just start to say a child's place is in a family. Right. I mean, that's how God designed us to be is part of a family unit, and that's always the best place. Um, I think about the U.S. foster system. Sure, it's not perfect, um, but still having some family units there uh, really help. Obviously, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, the doctor here, she can talk about some of the, the science behind what happens when we talk, start talking about some attachment disorders and things like that that come from institutional living. Um, but yeah, they're, they're real. Um, and as being an adoptive dad myself, of uh, a little girl who was in uh, an institution, um, there are some real things that happen. And as children grow up, their, their minds are wired in such a way that it really affects them for the long term and uh, for their, their entire life. And if you'd like mm -hmm. to speak to the, the science of that, it's always fascinating. Oh, so. sure. Okay, so uh, amen, just to throw that okay. out there, because we're at the Baptist Seminary, if we yeah. can. Um, so, I mean, from a very developmental perspective, we are hardwired to connect to a caregiver. I mean, mm -hmm. even from infancy, infants can see about 8 to 12 inches, which is about from the crook of your elbow to your eyes. And we're designed that way. We're designed to respond to others. We're, we're designed to respond to facial expressions, to mimic emotion from birth. Um, and foster families being in that close-knit group um, can facilitate that attachment types of relationships and the importance of that. It's really hard for children uh, to be in large groups and not have one-on-one -on -one type of caregiving. That being said, I work with some fabulous orphanage organizations around the world that are doing the absolute best that they can to provide high quality care. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, our job is to be as supportive of them and mm -hmm. uh, provide as much education as possible. So even with this, this smart amount of resources, they can do the best that they right. can do. So first and foremost, infants, babies, kids, all of us are meant to be in relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about orphanage care, a few things are really important to keep in mind. Um, has anyone ever actually been to an orphanage, like been to a, a baby room? Um, so one of the, the hardest things the first time I, I spent time in an orphanage is uh, I walked into a baby room and there was about 30 infants there and they were completely silent. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons that's the case is within the first 30 to 60 days of life, if you cry, and no one comes and meets that need, you simply stop crying. 
because uh, that's not a strategy that works. Where in a typically developing relationship, you know, if, if you guys have been around biological kids or had babies since birth, it's, it's maybe three seconds, especially those first few weeks when you're all like half asleep and you know, whatnot. Um, so the babies learn this strategy um, for how to get their needs met, and it's not to depend on people. And long term, that can affect the way that they think about relationship. It actually creates a model in their mind called internal working model for how they think about attachment and what constitutes parents and how well can I trust this person. Um, there's also physiological stuff. So if you put your, you're going to do this, work with me here, put your hand on your chest and say, I feel really silly doing this. What do you feel? Right? Do you feel the vibration and whatnot? Um, during the first year of life, first year of life, how many times do you pick up a baby? Thousands, hundreds of thousands, uh, depending on how crabby that baby is. Um, every time you move that baby, every time you sing to them, hold them, you're creating a sensory environment. They hear your voice, they feel your warmth. Um, children that are in orphanage care aren't getting that sensory stimulation. And as a result, long term, sometimes their brain doesn't know how to interpret sensory information correctly. It's not that we can't work with that, but it means that they have some difficulties with that type of situation. Yeah. Um, and then there's the stuff that you think about. In, in my experience, there's a lot of variability um, within orphanage care. Mm -hmm. Some of them can provide really high quality care. Some of them, as I said, are just doing the best that they can do. Uh, so there's probably gonna be physical things, um, emotional things, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I just wanna pause on, because this is kind of one of my soapboxes in life, is that self-regulation and your ability to calm your own emotion is taught um, and it's taught through a mentoring relationship with an adult, one-on-one. -on -one. And if you don't have that mentoring relationship with an adult, you don't know how to do it well. Um, so long-term, all of these things can lead to you know, behavioral problems or difficulty regulating or difficulty processing sensory information. Um, that being said, when you look at the literature of kids coming out of orphanage care, and there's a lot of variability, um, this is a, a quick, fast number, but about a third, a third of the kids come home and they need a little bit of support, maybe nutritional type of stuff, spend some time with the pediatrician, and they're absolutely fine. Um, about a third of the kids need a little bit more support, maybe some speech therapy, uh, maybe they need to spend some time with an occupational therapist, but after a couple of years, things really even out and they do just fine. Um, and about a third of the kids come home and they need a lot of support. And that's when particularly the ministry piece becomes so important and being able to wrap around Wrap, wrap our arms around those families uh, that are really struggling. Do you guys have thoughts? You know, one of the things that we experienced, my wife and I, when we, our middle child, our daughter is adopted um, from Ethiopia. We brought her home at 13 months, even at 13 months. A lot of people would look at that and go, you know, she's relatively young. She's got her whole life ahead of her. You know, hopefully nothing, you know, developmentally took place that's going to affect her long term. But we realized quickly that, yeah, the first 13 months, were, was, we're, we are not scientists. We are not doctors. We own a hair salon, you know. And, uh, and I've got a master's of divinity, you know. So I'm like, I know nothing about this. But uh, we learned very quickly that um, her experiences the first 13 months of her life have, have, has, has really shaped who she's now become. She, she'll be six in, in just a few days. And so, um, so now we take that into consideration on how we deal with her, um, whether it be how we engage her through communication, uh, how we discipline her, um, even how she eats and sleeps, and those things have, have really all been shaped by really the first 13 months of her life. And so it is profoundly uh, impactful on children's life being uh, those first so vitally important years of their lives being uh, institutionalized. Uh, one of the things that we thought was um, so amazing being a young um, uh, couple who's adopted and uh, we have a nine-year-old son as well. Actually, yeah, he'll be 10 in just a few days as well. But um, he, he's, from very early on, he slept very well through the night. And being young parents, we thought that was amazing. Um, you know, having a child that sleeps really well. When we brought Penelope home, she slept through the night. She never got out of her bed. She did all these things. And we were like, man, this is amazing. And then we actually started talking to people that were really smarter than we were. And they were like, well, this is why, you know, because... She was put in a bed and mm -hmm. she wasn't checked on for, you know, eight hours. And 
And then we were grieved, you know, by that. And so we switched how we thought about that, but also how we interacted with her even throughout the night. And so those years being institutionalized for all children, is, it, um, uh, it really shapes who they are. And so we as, um, as a, an adopted family really had to figure out how we deal with that and how to, um, how to change the way in which we interact with her. Um, I think the, the question also um, asked was how do we adjust, you know? The things that we do, so I primarily work in Haiti and we work with five different orphanages. Um, the one thing that we have counseled our, our leaders, our Haitian leaders on the ground. Um, Haiti is one of the most difficult countries to work in that we've been in. Um, and, um, and I will uh, stress as well, they're doing the best that they possibly can with the very limited resources they have. But one of the things that we said is that what we want is the, the ratio between children and caregiver to be as, as minimal as possible. So we really want like one caregiver, if possible, to buy like, just three kids, you know, that's very difficult. But as well, we really have worked over the past five years in engaging some of the male leaders in our communities and churches to be actively involved in the children's life on a daily basis. Not a weekly basis when they come to church or, or to whatever, but to spend a significant amount of time actually at the orphanage um, investing in these kids, teaching these kids, loving these kids, playing with these kids, helping develop skills within these children. And so those are the things that we've done as a family, um, as an adoptive family, but also how we've taken what we've learned over the past hundred years of kids being, you know, living in institutions, and we have definitely see the ramifications of that not being so positive. Now, how do we, with the knowledge that we have, everything that um, that we've heard today, how do we shift our thinking in terms of adopting children, bringing them into our own families, but also if, we're, if we have a presence internationally and we're working with orphanages, how do we rethink the way in which we're doing inst institutionalized care to, to set these children up for success, to give them the ability to be able to connect with each other, but also to connect with other adults, um, other caregivers, and do that really well. The last thing that we do is, is that we do not partner with churches or organizations that just want to do short-term missions. We don't believe um, uh, short-term missions is necessarily the answer. What we say is, is that you can come on a short-term mission trip, but it's, it comes at the cost of a long-term commitment to this specific orphanage or this specific community or this specific church. And, and then we really set up a lot of parameters in which they operate. If we take a team down, what does this look like? Well, it's not soccer with the kids for three hours for seven days and then you leave and those kids never see you again. So we, we really rethink the way in which we do a short-term mission trips as well. So I'll, I'll add something to that. Uh, the, um, as Lifeline Children's Services, something that we've seen that echoes you know, both what they're talking about, and it can't be understated in a room like this, is, is, the, is the power of the role of the caregiver. Mm -hmm. Yet internationally, they're the most overworked, ill-equipped, and underpaid individuals at an orphanage. Yeah. But they're the first responders of a child that has gone through trauma, grief, and loss that enters a home, right? And so you have a glowing need. Everyone wants to go in and hold the babies and hold the babies, but the real unforgotten lost, unreached people group in that room are your caregivers. Standing right there in the corner as you're going to help them, they're the ones that need equipped and trained. And so what we've done as an organization within Lifeline, we've seen this need over and over again where we adopt from, then also where we do international orphan care for aging out orphans. And so uh, to give an example, we have a training called caregiver education training, where our caseworkers and social workers travel to work with these caregivers um, to help them understand the child's past, to help them prepare for the present, and help them get prepared for the future as well. A lot of these caregivers as well, you can't bring a child to a level of healing that you haven't experienced yourself. It's just a, it's a true statement, right? And so these caregivers have gone through some of the same trauma, some of the same grief, some of the same loss. And so we have a whole section even dedicated to self-care to help these caregivers understand themselves so that they can then reach out to other people in that room. 
And as you look at the population that I primarily work in and unadopted works in, if you push these numbers even further, it gets staggering, right? Mm -hmm. Every single day, over 38,000 orphans will age out of an orphanage. All right, let's push that number further. 60% of that 38,000 of the girls will find themselves in some form of sexual exploitation. 10 to 15% of that 38,000 will commit suicide before they're 18. So when we look at, when we talk about institutionalized care, and we talk about the role of the first responder, i.e. the caregiver, those stats seem glaring because of where a child has come from to get to that spot. So we gotta look long-term development, especially in these places that we serve, really to equip those who are having direct impact on these children. We need to reshape the way we do orphan care, reshape the way we do mission trips to really think through who are the ones directly impacting the life of this child. Uh, it, it couldn't be stressed more because I feel like we want to go and do good things and feel good about the good that we do, which is, which is good. But there's also strategy and wisdom that already is happening in these countries in the local partnerships, right? We don't want to recreate the wheel and come in and do for someone that they can then do for themselves. So we have to think through orphan care. How are we doing this? What are good ways to do it? How do we bring in experts to understand the situation that a child has gone through? And how do we train these caregivers, even though their education background is probably from a lot of mixed areas, they probably can't read and write, the different international countries we've seen internationally, most of them can't read and write. Um, they come in because they need some job just to provide for their own family. Uh, some stay on the home, some leave. They're, they come from all different types of backgrounds but we gotta think through how we can equip them with just some simple, tangible tools to help them realize that love isn't enough. You know, as hard as that sounds, love is not enough. A lot of times in these places, you need to be equipped to understand that when a child has come through trauma, grief, and loss, you're dealing with a whole different being here. Uh, that you, we need to bring that into our tool belt. Well. To feedback off of, or to piggyback off of that, if love is not enough, what are the other resources available to support churches and ministries and even caregivers who are working with orphans and vulnerable children? What is out there? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, uh, Lifeline Children's Services, we have, if you go onto our website, lifelinechild.org, we have a whole resource tab that you can download things free, watch videos. I think the first thing, one resource isn't gonna solve this problem, right? It's first learning and understanding what the problem is. Do your homework, do your education, do your studies to realize, okay, what are, what are we actually facing here? What is this global orphan crisis that we're actually encountering internationally? Who is doing it well? Um, and, and, and what are, Yes, the resources, I think that's a good question, but I, I think I would really think through who are the, the people that are having an impact on children's lives? Who are those people that are really making a change in the country and how are they doing it? Um, yes, if those people are producing resources, and you know, I'll brag about our organization, we do some amazing things and we have equipped and trained social workers that do all of our international traveling within Lifeline. Um, it's not me being the expert coming in. I link way smarter people than me <laughs> to problems greater than I that they can then equip these caregivers to then lead and train them. Uh, so th that's, that's one spot. If you go to our resources tab, you have a lot of different resources to help navigate this. Yeah, I think when, I'd agree with you totally, just it, it comes back down to the people. Because ultimately, I think most of the time, we, we, have, a, we have a church, we have Jesus followers out there who, who want to see change. I don't think if, if we go in and, and we present a problem to anybody who's a follower of Jesus, they don't, they don't look, go, we, we've got to do something here. But here, here's the fact. Most people just say, Some, somebody needs to do something about that. We, we need people like you who are going to take your lunch and come in here today to be like, I'll be the person that does something about that. I'll be the person that stands up, who leads something in my church, who goes and serves, who, who figures out that problem um, that needs to be figured out. Um, we need those people around the world. Are there resources? I know uh, Alter 84 
and No More Orphans has a, a ton of great resources. I want Johnny to share about that, about how you can engage your church in orphan care. You know, how you can serve adoptive families um, that are out there. I know for us at, at Compassion, much of what I see that we do as an organization is, is really orphan prevention. Um, I, that, that's something that's just it, on my heart. I think that we need to talk about a lot more in the church. Uh, we talk about orphan care. We talk about adoption. But, but what about stopping that number of 153 million orphans and, and making it go back? Um, you know, I look at it in, in the country that my daughter was adopted from. Uh, the year that we adopted her, there was 60, 60 to 70 kids adopted that year and, and two and a half million orphans in the country. I came back and you go, man, you had this sigh of relief that uh, we, we had, had finished a journey in which we really didn't know we just started a journey, of course, <laughs> if you've ever been through that. And uh, you're just starting that, but you also look and go, man, what about the rest of them? You know, what, what about the, the 3 or 4% of moms who are dying in childbirth? And, and because of that, their, their kids are, are being orphaned very early on because of very preventable things. What about the large majority of these kids that are being orphaned just simply because of poverty-related issues? And these are all things that we can do something about. But someone's got to be the voice. Someone's got to stand up. Someone's got to tell their story. Um, I know at, at Compassion... One of the things, you know, we, we all have different roles and we play in our, our organizations and our lives that we, we're in. You know, for us, we, we all have one job title. We're all child advocates. Because, you know, there's 400 million kids around the world who are living in poverty, who are on a razor's edge, ready to be one of those who's considered an orphan because of the vulnerable state that they're in. And we've got to tell their story. And uh, I, I think you are a resource that we have for our churches because we've got to go share that story. I know as, at our church as we've had adoptive families who've, who've come into our church, adoptive kids, man, the church comes to us and goes, hey, so, so how do we need to care for this family? And, you know, they're sitting there going, we'll do whatever it takes. And I think most people have that heart, but they just don't know. So getting this education, getting these resources and telling the story, I think is probably one of the biggest things that we can do to really see a difference in the orphan crisis in this world. What would you guys say is, first of all, the role of the local church in orphan care, and what would be the role of the caregiver? This is when I defer to everybody that's gone to <laughs> I wanna, seminary. I, I want Johnny to answer sure. that Go one. Stop. Yeah, I really yeah, do. Stop. I want you to talk about what you, you know. Um, I, 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 think, I think both the caregiver and the local church play um, equally important roles in caring for orphans. But if, if we step back and look at it from a theological standpoint, the Bible is pretty clear that Christians are, are to be compassionate, loving, caring individuals and a collective, the church. Um, and so there, there are many scriptures that, um, that uh, command the church to go forth and to care for the orphan, widowed, and vulnerable. And so the role in which the church plays is, is, is amazing. I often think about um, a, a couple of different stories in Scripture, but um, oftentimes you either see Jesus or the disciples doing what? Yes, sharing the love of God, um, preaching the Word, but also meeting tangible and physical, physical needs. And so that's the approach in which I take. Um, I, I, I don't consider myself a theologian or an expert in this field. So me actually being here for the second year in a row is well, quite hilarious. Um, but I, I do say that um, I, I just play a small role. And as a believer, as a Christian, uh, who's a part of a local church, who's passionate about orphan care and a part of an organization, you know, we just, we want to, yes, both be uh, proclaimers of the word, but doers of the word as well. And so we want to do that really well. So what is the role of the church in, in orphan care? It's vital. It's the utmost. It's important. I mean, sharing the love of Christ through meeting needs is, is important. Jesus often uh, accepted children. He didn't turn them away. Many times the disciples would say, no, shoo, shoo, and Jesus would call them in. And so um, the, 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 the way in which the question is, is, is asked makes me feel like I have to go, well, what's the, the role? The roles are so vitally important. The church and the caregiver. Mm -hmm. I loved what Garth said in terms of, you know, the front lines of these children are 
are not necessarily short-term missions and not necessarily American organizations coming in, but it's these caregivers and so those so vitally important. So if you're part of a church, I, I wish there was I wish every church in the world was as passionate about orphan care as I am, you know, because I believe it's uh, so directly tied to the gospel, and uh, it's inseparable. Um, and so every church should, should understand its role to care for the, for the vulnerable, the broken of um, the darkest places of this world, but understand that uh, the church is not, I'm not going to say that. Um, I'll get in trouble at Beeson. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the, the church is not the answer, the gospel is. And so the gospel is the answer. And, um, and the caregivers are so vitally important. And so the church should actively seek to, yes, love on these kids, but also to, to love on and care for um, the caregivers. I, th I think, too, I mean, I, I was meeting with an organization not too long ago, and they were talking about strategy and talking about or how do we engage this uh, third world country? How do we do this? And they were just kind of thinking through things and like, okay, we're going to go through the local church as if it's some part of their strategy. And I just sat back and listened, and I was like, from a theological standpoint, I'm like, I was kind of hurt by that as if it was somehow their design. <laughs> Realizing that before the foundation of the earth, Ephesians 3.10, the manifold wisdom of God, it's through the local church might be put on display. God's intention and design was to put his bride on display and to make his gospel known through the local church. This is his design. It's his plan. It's not ours. Not crev, you know, crafty thinking people in a room that come up with strategies to, quote unquote, work through the local church internationally. Uh, and I think that's important because we need to know our place in the story. We need to know how we fit within a larger narrative of scripture, right? Know where we are in this time in history and also know what God's intent is and how he wants things to go forth. And so how we partner with people internationally really is looking for the local church. Uh, where Unadopted Works Internationally really is coming alongside local churches that share the same mission and vision that the gospel has and Lifeline has to care for orphans and widows in their distress. And so when these align for us, we're like, okay, great, let's do this together. And then we, we think of how can we work our way out of a job? We don't want Lifeline Unadopted's name on anything internationally. I want to be the one that's helped thinking through it, working with leaders, and then kind of just slowly taking that backward step so we're not even seen internationally. And that's the greatest part, because then we don't have to be the hero of the story, right? You know who the hero of the story is internationally, especially in orphan care, because you can come back and champion a cause all you want and play a slideshow and talk about all the great things you've done, but you're missing it. You're missing who the real hero of that story is, i.e. the local church body, but that partner who is then championing the cause in their own community. Uh, it's, it's, it's crucial to get that because I think, and I do think theology does play a role in practice, especially in nonprofit and charity. It would be interesting to study to see how people do international work that is secular and sacred, but how you know, sacred organizations their theology affects their implementation of projects. It'd be something to, to look at. Uh, but I know that when, you, when it's correct and it's lined up well, man, it's just awesome. You can come back from these international partners and tell a story that's not yours, um, and it's bigger than you, and then you can get people excited about it, and you get to go see it. You get the front row seat to what God's doing um, internationally, and that's what's what I get in my organization, which I love. So the next time you get on a plane, and you know you're in here you're probably planning your next mission trip or raising funds to go you know ask that question how can I champion the local church when I'm there um, you know you might be there for eight days you know in the next three years so so how, how can you really make sure the local church uh, is having the most success hmm. I mean think about a child who's in an orphanage who's had 25 different white women come and hold them in their first year of life and then when they're 18 months old, they're being adopted by maybe another white woman. You know, is that person going to come for a few days and leave? You know, you just think about that. Well, maybe you can pour to that caregiver who can do that. Sure. Maybe you can free them up to have a different, to do something so that they can go hold the babies more. 
and just thinking through different ways we can serve. You know, probably most of you have, but if you haven't read the book When Helping Hurts, you know, do that before you leave the country again and uh, make sure that that's part of your mindset. And we're the same way. Um, I think to be healthy, uh, Compassion International, we only work in and through local churches overseas. Um, for us, you know, we, we had a, a real real life example this year of, of what happens when the organization ceases to exist in a country. Um, if you know anything about Compassion, if you're a sponsor, you probably maybe uh, prayed a prayer or, or sent a letter to a senator or something. But this year, we actually had to close down our program in India. We worked with 130,000 kids in India. And what happens when you can't work with those kids all of a sudden anymore? Well, here, here's the quick answer is that, you know what? The local church was still there. The local church that every one of those kids came to was still there. Now, the funding, that looks a lot different now. And maybe their, their ministry model looks a lot different. But that was what the amazing thing was is that each one of those pastors was like, okay, life's going to be different, but these are still our kids, mm -hmm. and we're going to figure out how to care for them. And again, just championing the local church and making sure um, making sure they're the ones who, who, are, who are ready for the long haul there. I'll say one thing about the local church's role in orphan care. Uh, American churches can have significant impact in other parts of the world through caring for orphans. They, it, you can if, you, if you're in pastoral leadership in some, some way, shape, or form in your church, you can have a profound impact. Um, but it's not going to happen in a two- to three-year vision. You know, It's like, we're going to focus here for a year, and then we're going to focus here for a year. Um, whatever, that's fine. It makes for great billboards and, uh, and maybe a little bit of a funding campaign, but it's not going to have long-term impact anywhere. Um, I'm, talking about act I'm not talking about you know, making disciples, I'm talking about caring for children, uh, which are both, um, they go hand in hand. But I will say one of uh, a profound way local churches can have impacts in the global orphan crisis is actually caring for the families within their local context who are adopting and fostering. Mm -hmm. And so what I love to see churches passionate about is, is that we have five families here who are adopting and here's how we're caring for them day in and day out. Uh, we have 10 families who want to do foster care, and this is how we as the body are caring for them day in and day out. And their strategy goes well beyond the day that they get off an airplane and come down the escalator and everybody cheers. It's like, well, that's the beginning of the journey there. That's when it gets really tough. Raising the $40,000 to adopt internationally was a piece of cake to what they're going to experience for the next 18, 22, 24 months. And so what we have done as a local church is actually set up kind of processes and systems and support roles for all these people to gather around them and love on them and care for them as they go through this journey. And so, um, so I would say you know, the church has a significant role in playing for orphan care. It needs to have long-term strategy if you're going to have an international presence. And, but one of the most effective things that you can do locally is to support your families within your church. Encourage them to adopt, encourage them to foster, but then give them the support they need when they say yes. I just want to yeah. toss this out there. So I, I think one of, one of the, the subtle things that you guys are, are talking about is everybody's called to minister to mm -hmm. the widows, to the orphans, to the vulnerable children. Not everybody is necessarily called to foster and adopt. Sure. And those mm -hmm. other parts of the ministry yep. are just as important yep. right. mm -hmm. and is just a much a part of the body of Christ ministering to the widows and orphans and vulnerable children. And many times people, uh, or at least in my experience, many times people say, well, I'm not really doing anything because I'm, I'm not fostering, I'm not adopting. Don't minimize that role yeah. and, and glorify those folks that even if they're not called to do the direct work are doing this indirect work mm -hmm. that help these families thrive within yeah. the church community. That's great. I'll give you a, a quick example of that. We um, were at a pretty large church here in town, and we were helping set up uh, an orphan care ministry, and we were going to launch it, and we had this big kind of meet and greet um, after church one Sunday, and we did this big presentation, and an elderly lady came up to me afterwards. Um, she was probably in her late 70s, the sweetest lady, and she says, um, Johnny, I really want to get involved, but I'm not fostering, and I'm definitely not adopting. What can I do? And I asked her, I said, what are you passionate about? What do you love to do? What do you do on a consistent basis? She says, I love to bake and I love to knit. 
I was like, there you go. That's how you're going to serve. I said, there are a lot of families in this church who are fostering and adopting. What if you actually baked a pie and, um, and if the child comes in, knit them a blanket um, and, and, and give that. And she couldn't, there's such a big church, she couldn't do it for every family. But um, we had families um, that were like, and I would go to her and I would say, okay, here, the child, uh, they're about to foster this child. It looks like it's going to be a long-term placement is uh, female, 10 months old. She would, by hand, knit them a blanket and then bake them a pot and take it over there and give it to them. And now this child, um, Lord willing, ever went back to, to, to be with their birth family to could take that blanket, you know, with them. And if it was an older child, remember this sweet, beautiful little old lady who came and gave me a blanket. And so, and she was like, it, it was like, I can do that. You know, you're empower me to serve, um, serve the orphaned, uh, serve the vulnerable and serve these families. And, uh, and she did it faithfully for a couple of years, and it was amazing. So everybody plays a role. The question is, is what role do you play? I don't know. We can't answer that question, but you can. I, I, I'll say one thing. It, the families and churches need to understand that this child is, it has needs that they don't understand. The trauma that they've come from, the grief, the loss that these children have come from, now they're trying to attach and bond to a whole new family in a whole new country in a whole new setting. And now they're around other kids that look different, smell different, run around different, talk different than them. There's a lot going on there. And families mean well to help support that family, but they need to help, they, they need to be equipped as well to help support that family well. It's, a, it's another plug. Equip to Love is a resource that we have for families within Lifeline. It's a resource guide, videos, everything's free download it, watch the videos. It helps families help care for those families well. Uh, I just heard horror stories of families meeting well, wanting to love on those kids, but what they're doing was, you know, hurting more than helping in a sense because what that kid has gone through. And not every family is going to know that child's past story, past trauma, but they can at least support that family in a way that's actually going to be beneficial. Uh, in a way that actually will meet tangible needs uh, for that family. Could, could you give some practical ways that we could help our churches um, with, like, the attachment when they get come to church? Could you? I, I just think about the example of, yeah. hey, there's an adoptive family who comes in who uh, who's who's got a new baby, and then all of a sudden somebody's always trying to grab them and hold no, them and things like that. Baby. I mean, and that's one of those things when we start to talk about those people in the church, they go, "Yeah, I've never thought about that, but that makes total sense." You can so, touch the tootsies, but nothing else. Right. So, so yeah. 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 yeah, expand on that a little bit. Um, so, especially with very young children, um, attachment relationships form during the the second half of the first year of life. Right, and so this is again your kind of your internal working model for how you think relationships work, um, and it carries forth throughout your entire life. So if you think people are trustworthy by 12 months of age, more than likely when you're 40, you're going to still think people are trustworthy and they're worthy of relationships. Um, but that's meant to um, develop with a specific caregiver. That's part of the reason that, for example, in short-term mission trips. Um, there, there's been a movement to move away from individuals that are just going to come in and out like a revolving door holding the babies. That's not good for them, right? Because they're trying to develop a specific attachment relationship. It's not that you don't want to support. And as I, as they were, we, we've all been saying, if you're going to support, support the caregivers. Um, but they need to develop that specific attachment relationship. But the same same thing is true within the church communities. Um, for the first three four months that a child comes home. Um, we usually tell families to keep it simple and keep it close. Um, you know, spend all of your time developing that attachment relationship, just like you would if you were to bring a biological home, a biological child home. You have about two or three months where, mm -hmm. I mean, you're here all the time. It's, it, I probably shouldn't talk about this, but if you've ever breastfed, you have no choice. You are here mm -hmm. all the time for 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you're bringing home an eight-year-old, they still need to have that closeness within their social network. So one of the things that you can do very tangibly uh, within the church ministries is allow that parent kind of that golden hour or kind of that, that time uh, with their child, but also make sure everybody else within the community knows that. Um, and then as they're transitioning it out, because we, we want our kids to explore, like we want them to make friends, that's part of the job of a child. 
um, making sure that you know the nursery workers and uh, the folks that not, not that they need to hear a child's story because that's private and mm -hmm. I, I think that that's something uh, that should remain at the discretion of the child we should be very careful with who we share their story with um, but understanding how their history or how a history of trauma might affect the way they interact mm -hmm. so if this child can't self-regulate or has trouble with that please by all means tell the nursery caregiver you know what these are some strategies that work really well at home mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you might want to try this and this and this yeah. Um, so simple things like that, and in, in my experience, and I, you know, I'm a perpetual optimist, most people want to help. Mm -hmm. Most people want to do good. They just don't know mm -hmm. how, yep. and they're often ignorant about the best practices. And if you tell them two or three, don't give them too much, because if you give them too much, yeah. it just, it's gone. Um, if you tell them two or three really practical things, mm -hmm. it makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with a, a very large church in Dallas, which is big churches in Dallas, um, and their their service was incredibly loud. They had um, a band that played beautiful praise and worship music, um, and they the families didn't understand why these children that they had been adopting internationally uh, came in and had terrible, terrible tantrums after church services were, were over. Mm -hmm. And there were so many pieces that um, it just wasn't a trauma-informed system. So as I said, they have trouble processing sensory information. Loud music is really hard. Very practical level. They uh, had a little basket full of earplugs at the beginning of the, the thing as you walked into to the sanctuary so that if a child gets overwhelmed with sound, they actually worked for the for the older adults in the church too. They liked the earplugs. Um, <laughs> that they could just pop those in so they can still be a part of the community. They can still be a part of the church without that overwhelming you know, sense of uh, things going on, or um, sometimes some of the really cool churches will have like the massive playground with all the colors and whatnot. Children from institutional care aren't mm -hmm. used to that level of stimuli. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with a family, and their families are much more educated now than they were 20 years ago when I started working in this field. Um, and they went directly from picking up their 13 year old uh, from a Bulgarian orphanage to Disney World. <laughs> I know. Uh, not even just to Disney World, to Disney World with all the aunts and all the uncles wow. and the grandparents, because wow. we're celebrating we're here. But what we know is that child doesn't even know what to make of that, right? You have to slowly integrate and make more um, complex systems for them, both mm -hmm. in terms of color and whatnot, but also in terms of family. Start out, I am safe, me and you, here together. And then we bring in slowly these outside people, because too much can be overwhelming and confusing. Mm -hmm. Now we want to take a couple of minutes and be able to answer your questions. So um, feel free. We'll take a couple of questions. And our panelists, if you don't mind repeating the question, just so that for the recording's sake that we can have those on there. Okay, so the question was, how much of the sensory overload is cultural versus trauma-induced? It's too hard to tease out to really to talk about that in a, in a meaningful way. Um, I'm, I'm working on a research study right now um, that we're, we're getting ready to, to present at the International Conference for Adoption Research, where depending on the type of trauma a child has in their history, so for example, a child with a history of abuse, both cognitively and biologically, brain chemistry-wise, processes sensory information differently than a child that's experienced neglect. Mm -hmm. um, and then the cultural piece just adds another bit of noise into that. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a very practical person. So at the end of the day, um, there are scientists out there that want to tease out the details of that. My thing mm -hmm. is, on a practical level, you're walking into the church and it's going to be loud. What are we going to do about this? We'll, we'll, we'll work on the why in a little bit, but for the most part, I'm, I'm focused on survival in the moment and being proactive. Mm. Yeah. Do you guys have any better thoughts on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would just say, it's extreme practical. Man, every child's unique. Mm -hmm. yeah. And every child's story from every country and every family. And so there's there's probably not one answer for any that, that covers everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've even heard some of our trainers when they go internationally and they train caregivers, 
uh, that the effects of trauma, that trauma, that forced trauma can have almost the same effect as just plain old trauma. Forced trauma, like blows to the head mm -hmm. in football, can have the same effect as just trauma on a child. Mm -hmm. And so if you just let that sink in and, and you know, go and look at even those studies, it's a, when, when trauma comes about, even the, the fear, when, when people are in a perpetual state of fear, it, 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 you can't attach, you can't bond, you can't do anything normally that you would. And it, even our trainers talk about, you know, the, the fight, flight, or, you know, the freeze type of mindset that a child at that is in. Uh, and just to echo what the doctor was saying, it's, it's when we can understand where that child is, it gives us context to understand behavior. But without that context, we're just making wild guesses to try to figure things out, kind of shooting in the dark. Can I, I just, this, this is a bit of an aside, so I apologize, but kind of to echo that point. Um, I was working with um, a group of teenagers at a residential treatment center. Uh, some of them were domestically in foster care. Some of them had been children that were adopted internationally and um, were not successful in, in the home. So they had been moved to this um, residential treatment facility. And so when we first started working with them, uh, on average, they had about nine incidences a day. And an incidence was we had to call psychiatrics, we had to call the police, we had to put this child in a containment. So it, this, these are big issues. Um, so um, they came to us and they're like, well, where do we start? Um, and all of these kids had a, a history of abuse and neglect. Um, and I'm like, okay, so tell me about your practices around food. And it turned out, you know, if, if you've ever worked with a child or anyone that's been hungry, uh, they have food insecurity. They'll eat and eat and eat and eat and eat even when they're not hungry to the point where they'll make themselves sick. Because even though you know there's food, on this deep intrinsic limbic system level, there's this fear that food's not going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so they literally had a padlock around the fridge mm -hmm. and on the cabinets because the kids would steal food. So that was the first change we made. Um, and we got rid of the padlocks, we got rid of, of the little children's safety things that they had on the cabinets. Um, and for the, for the teenagers, we said, if you go, and they had house parents, uh, if you go to your house parents and you ask with manners and respect, you can have a snack, particularly a fruit or vegetable, anytime you want. Um, and for the first two weeks, I mean, we went through like an ungodly amount of bananas. It was like a horde of angry monkeys had broken into the place. Um, but what we found is that lasted for about two weeks. And once it got to the point that they knew the food was going to be there, they didn't need it anymore. And within a month, we went from having nine incidences a day to one every nine days. And we were able to reallocate those resources mm -hmm. because we created this sense of felt safety. It isn't really about the food. Mm -hmm. It's about that sense of mm -hmm. safety. And if you can create that in your yeah. ministry, if you can create that in your home, that is when you really get healing change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Life? Yeah. I mean, I've seen kids up to 29 still in a home that mm -hmm. they, in, in Africa, certain countries you have certain ages where they have to age out, yeah. you know, 15, 16, 17. Uh, but, you know, even in West Africa and Liberia, kids they're dropped off there since they were, you know, two months and they've lived there all their entire life and they're still there. They probably have a different role uh, at that home, but they, they're still at that home. So life, yeah. So I, I would just say um, trauma is developmental, mm -hmm. right? And 
even though you may experience trauma as a young child, mm -hmm. during any time of transition, during any time of grief, during any time of happiness, mm -hmm. you're gonna relive that trauma to an extent. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. so I got called to orphan ministry when I was 12, and it was not that like glorious, like light shines down, that didn't happen for me. Um, my best friend, starting at age 12, her name's Morgan, and she was a foster kid. And you know, we're 40 something year old women now, and we've kind of walked through this journey of foster care together and what it really means to rethink what attachment means when your biological mother loses custody and when each and every single one of your younger siblings get adopted and you don't. Um, and on your wedding day, when you're crying in your, she, she was adopted our senior year, when you're crying in your adopted mother's lap because we couldn't find your biological mom to invite her to the wedding, right? She grieves that. Mm -hmm. um, Any time there is this season of change and season of transition, and one of the things that I would really say is if we know that trauma is developmental, then the interventions we use and the support we give to individuals also needs to be developmental, mm -hmm. and it needs to be proactive. Um, that stuff comes up not only during negative seasons in their life, but sure. also positive. Mm -hmm. On her wedding day, when her mm -hmm. daughter was born, mm -hmm. um, these are things that we grieved and, and walked through together. She didn't yeah. feel like she knew what it was to be a mom. Um, so being able to provide that support proactively and letting them know that you're there is probably one of the biggest pieces I've encountered. Do you guys have thoughts on that? We, um, I'll just put it simply, for us as a family, uh, we say this a lot, big days are the hard days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we just have to know that. Mm -hmm. And we know that's not going to stop when, when Mother's Day rolls around, you know, when she's a mom. It's a big day. It's going to be a hard day. Mm -hmm. and so we just prepare for that. From a, a biblical, theological, you know, standpoint, I think what you can do as future pastors and ministers is, is to understand the vast majority of the people that are sitting in your congregation have experienced some level of trauma. Um, and so um, a great deal of sympathy uh, goes a long way. So um, understanding that. Um, but as well, um, having a theological and philosophical um, roadmap. How am I going to deal with this when it comes up? Because it will come up. So I think actually thinking through the process of walking with these families or these individuals who've come from hard places, what are the steps I'm going to take? What's the right thing? So I think asking this question early on is vitally important. It's going to help you shape not only your own understanding, but the staff in which you lead. How are we going to deal with this? So there has to be some type of process in place. If you as a church leader don't have some type of relationship with a local uh, counseling organization, whether it be Pathways or whatever, then I would say, man, you're already a step behind. And so uh, forming those relationships are going to be key. So your understanding of that, sympathizing with these people, walking with them, having a plan and process in place is going to be so important. Um, but this goes far beyond dealing with families who have adopted or, ad or, or, or children who have adopted or come through the foster care system. The vast majority of the people that are sitting in your congregation have on some level experienced trauma, and they think about it, if not daily, weekly, they think about it. It affects the way in which they view you, the way in which they view other people, how they make decisions, and how they integrate within life. And so we have to be equipped to be able to deal with these people. And it's not just a theological most pastors, guys from my tribe, we just want to, it's, it's just it's theological. I've got a theological answer for that. But Sally, uh, when she's sitting, you know, in the bed and she's mourning this or something, she not only has to have a theological understanding of what's happening, but she, there needs to be the practical there. You've got to be able to walk her through that. So yeah, give her the knowledge. Give her the theological, but also say, here's how we're going to support you and walk with you. Here are the people that you can call. Here are the people that you can email or text. Um, and here's how we can actually help us that. So uh, a plan is so vitally important as, as pastoral leadership. Thank you so much to our panelists. Unfortunately, we are out of time, though. But, uh, Johnny, I do want you to take a minute to um, speak of the resources that you brought that yeah. are available to you guys as you leave. You, um, you can grab some on the way out yeah. of the box if you want to speak about those for a second. 
And if you have a question, we're, we'll hang around. But there's two resources in those boxes in the back. Feel free to grab as many as you want. One's woven. It's Gospel Tension and the Work of Orphan Care. It's, it's a six-week Bible study. So if you get you know, a coffee shop and walk through that, that's free to you. It's available as well as uh, one strategy for Gospel Center Orphan Care and the the church. And so if you, you may, I, I want to I wanna start an orphan care ministry in my local church. This is a small, helpful guide. It's kind of going to kind of give you a framework, but that's it. So these are great resources and they're free to you and they're in the, uh, um, in the two boxes on the back table. Great. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you for coming today.